Welcome to First Baptist Church of Walnut Creek. I know in just a moment, but first let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we can boldly come before you, bring our requests. And so, Lord, what's on my heart right off the bat is, of course, praying for our congregation, praying for the people in our church, that we would develop a heart attitude and see the need for us to follow your great commission adding the Christian disciplines into our life, practicing them every day, walking with you. You told the disciples, come and see, and they did. And then they were with you for three and a half years, daily with you. We want that same desire in our heart where we are following after you. And from those 12 men, it's like they changed the entire world. They changed their families. They changed their loved ones. And it's not something that they did. It's just they shared who you are and what you did. Help us to have that same drive that, and recognize the power of the message of the gospel. Lord, we pray for your word as it is being communicated today. We pray that hearts would be changed. We pray that, Lord, that you would be seen first in our lives. We recognize that there are needs out there, and we lift them up before you. We pray that your message in other churches and through the uh, word of mouth of the missionaries that are scattered throughout the world and even here in the United States, that it would be boldly and clearly proclaimed. And that you would have an impact upon those who need to hear your truth. So, Lord, we just ask for your favor today as we gather. And we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity of singing these great truths about you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask you to open up your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, submit to your own husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Lord, we turn our hearts to you. We ask, Lord, that you would take control of our minds in a way in which you give us clarity of thought. Help us to think your thoughts after you. Help us to have a biblical understanding of what truth is and remove all the distractions from the world from us over the next few moments so we can have a better understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. When the family is discussed, how often do you hear the Bible referred to as a source in the discussion? How is the family defined? What's the purpose of the family? Why do we even need the family? How about this? Where does the family come from? Who's involved in a family? What's the framework of the family? It seems that these are questions that are never addressed in the discussion concerning the family. There is such a demand to be inclusive that the idea of the family has been reimagined from its traditional foundations. No longer is the family based upon a specific gender or sex or culture or tradition. The family may have multiple adults or none at all. It may be of the same sex or different sexes. It may or may not have offspring through biology, adoption, or other species. Let's let you think about that for a moment. But Christianity gives us answers to these questions that are found in the Scriptures. It doesn't surprise us since God created mankind. He also instituted the family as the core foundation in His creation. God did not create Adam and Eve and then watch them as a child watches an ant farm wandering around and wondering, what are they going to do next? God instituted the family. There is one man and there is one woman. 
and working together, they fulfill the established purpose of God. Do you believe that? Whether you believe that or recognize it or not, that doesn't change the truth that that is what God has established. Now, we have been in the book of Colossians. And in the book, we have seen the book is about the life of Christ. I know you're in chapter 3 of Colossians, but I want you to turn back to chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. For this captures the entire theme of the book. So as you're reading or you're looking, it says, For in him, referring to Christ, dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. Now this is the centerpiece, the principal matter of the life of Christ in the believer. We, we are so connected to Christ since our salvation that you and I are to think ourselves as being in Christ. Turn to Romans chapter 6. Turn to Romans chapter 6 as we see this laid out. This is the thought that the Apostle Paul is trying to get to the believer. And it is an imperative thought that we learn to think as we see things. Because since the day that you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, it is not just me and I'm all by myself, it's me and Christ. And so when I think of myself, it's really us. And in Romans chapter 6, verse 2, Paul says, in answering a question about, found in verse 1, shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? Paul says, in the most definitely not terms, no way, Jose, how shall we who die to sin live any longer in it? Verse 3, or do you not know that as many of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Verse 4, therefore, since you were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead, the glory of the Father through the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. That idea of baptism that he's talking about, this is we are identified with him. So when Christ died on the cross, we died. When Christ was buried, we were buried. When Christ was raised from the dead, we were raised from the dead. So the principle that we see of the life of Christ is found in chapters 1 and 2 of Colossians. This is what the Apostle Paul is teaching the Colossians, is that you and I, as believers in Jesus Christ, we are with Him to think Christ is for us to see ourselves as in Christ. There is no distinction. Well, He's God and I'm not God. Yes, but as we view our life, we view ourselves as being with Christ. That is how we are supposed to see ourselves. So, does Christ live in sin? No. So, are we supposed to live in sin? The answer is supposed to go, no. Is Christ supposed to live in right? Does Christ live in righteousness? We would say, yes. Are we supposed to live in righteousness? The answer is like, yes. Why? Because I'm in Christ. And it's helping the new believers to recognize your old person, your old ways have been done away with. And what's new, you're with Christ. So it's helping that thinking, that change of mind. So, go back to Colossians. We are going to be hopping around a little bit in the New Testament today. So the first two chapters, we see the principle of the life of Christ in the believer. And then we see the life of Christ in the position of the believer in the first part of chapter 3. And remember the thought. In verses 1 through 4, we are to seek heavenly values. Set your mind on Christ, where he's above, right? Where, where are we thinking? We're thinking where Christ is. Where's Christ? He's in heaven. And then verses 5 through 11, we are to slay the earthly vices. These are the vices of things that we are to put to death, he says. Members which are on earth, fornication, uncleanness, so forth and so on. Put this stuff to death. In other words, stop doing it. And then, in verses 12 through 17, we are to substitute heavenly virtues. 
In verse 12, he says, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. That's us. Put on these tender mercies. Put this stuff on like put it on a jacket. Clothe yourself in these great heavenly virtues that belong to Christ. Because Christ wears them and so should we. So now we see the life of Christ in the practice as it is displayed in each one of us. And we have taken measure of the new man. And we have seen where our focus is to be and the virtues that should characterize each one of us. We look through and each one of us should be looking at verses 12 through 17 and say, yeah, that's each one of us. We are to be forgiving one another, long-suffering, bearing with one another. And we go on and on. We're like, yeah, that should be us. Those are the clothes that I'm wearing made by Christ. And as we look at those virtues, we go, these are the things of the heart. Now we turn to the things of the home. This is where Christ's life is put on display. Verse 18, we see it's directed to the wives. Verse 19, husbands. Verse 20, children. Verse 21, fathers. Verse 22, servants. Chapter 4, verse 1, masters. So you see how this is laying out? The direction is, Here's where the life of Christ is to be displayed for everybody to see. Over the fireplace, maybe you have a mantle of some sort, and you display valuable things or statues or gifts that people have given to you. It's something you want everybody to see when they come in your house. You're like, ooh, look at this. Maybe it's a conversation piece. But it's something that you want everyone to see. You have it hidden in the closet. It's out there for, hopefully, it's the first thing that I see when they walk in the door. That's what these are to be displayed in the, in the home. And see how everybody in the home is supposed to display the virtues of Christ. And so Paul directs, here's what's supposed to be displayed, and here's the responsibility of each of these people in the home. The home is the primary place where the life of Christ is displayed and worked out. The Word of God is the primary authority of the family institution. And as we address each section, I'm going to ask each of you if you would pray for the members of God's household. Be praying for the wives. Be praying for the husbands. Be praying for the kids, the the servants, the masters. And we'll get to that. Be praying for the fathers. You notice it doesn't say mothers in here. Okay? Does that mean there's, there's, no, there's, no, uh, there's no comment for mothers in here? They're working too hard. Maybe it's because fathers aren't doing what they should be doing. I don't know. We could speculate on that all day long. But the important thing is, here's, what's supposed, here's where the direction is going. So we begin with wives. You've got your notes so take, note, take things on here and you will notice that you've got a lot of empty spaces. I don't have any fill-ins in there for you. This is for you to take as many notes as possible. A lot of this stuff, you're just going to be writing down Bible verses and maybe turning to them later. You might expect that the first person to be addressed should be the husbands. And if you believe in any of the rhetoric made by those who propagate the myth of the Bible being based on a system of social structures and practices in which men dominate, oppress, and exploit women, you might agree with that and say, hey, how come men aren't first? But you see, men aren't addressed first. Welcome to Bible 101. Women are first. The Bible, especially the New Testament, has done something in which no other civilization has done in any other culture. It has restored womanhood to its God-created position with purpose, and it clarifies man's attitude towards it. Throughout history, women have been viewed as property, possessions, servants, slaves, sexual objects. In some societies, women didn't even have any rights at all. They were not seen as equal before the law, which means they could not bring a legal case to the judge, or to any, any person in power. 
It was not believed that women even had a soul. You might be surprised that it's more than one culture that believed that. That women were soulless. She could be traded, sold, or discarded in the snow if she was unwanted as a baby. Oh, we got a baby. Toss her in the snowbank. In the coming of Christ, he changed the way that we view one another. In Christ, what you were is not what you are. In Christ, who you were does not matter. You are now a new creation in Christ. In Christ, there is no distinction before the Lord. This spiritual equality is to find a new way of expression in the Christian home. So, in our verse today, there are three things that stand out. First, we see the command to wives. Second, we see the condition of the wives. And in third, the conduct of the wives. We want to be clear in our understanding of what the command is here. And this will help us to understand the place and the privilege of submission. So our first point, the command to the wives, Colossians 3.18. It's clear as we read this verse, wives, submit, it states, to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. What? Someone to say something? Oh, okay, so we already got a comment. Why do you want to make that comment? Oh, I see. So, and you're afraid I may not say that. <laughs> see, we have a natural thing that we want to make sure that something is said in society because when we hear this, hair on the back, we go, wait a minute, there's conditions here. Well, what are the conditions? Let's make, let's make sure that we are clear and straight on this. The Bible does not promote what the world promotes. The Bible promotes here is the word of God and this is the truth. And God has laid this out. Now in this little verse, what she is saying is true. But there's a whole lot more of it there than that. And it's important for us as Christians to grasp this truth so that we can move and recognize what this role is to the wives. Because it's not addressed to women as a whole, is it? Or is it? Are men excluded from this? Or are they? Huh. Well, let's take a look at this stuff first. Because it's proper to begin with a little grammar review. Now, stick with me on this grammar. Some of you hate grammar. I hated grammar in, in school. I got a big fat C. And I speak fluent English. But... I hated it, and maybe you did too. The verb submit, hupotasso, is a present middle imperative. And you're going, big whoop de doo I know, big whoop de doo But here's the first thing that we should notice about it. The imperative verb provides us the sense that there is immediate action. The imperative, it's a command. It tells us this is something that's not optional. It's not something that's passive. It's something that wives are supposed to do. Okay. What exactly are they supposed to do? Well, the second thing we have to, when we're breaking this down, is listening to the voice of it. What's the voice? It tells us that either the subject is doing the action or receiving the action. That's what the voice of a verb tells us. Now, it helps us to have examples in English. Remember, the active voice tells us the subject is doing the action. Like Mike feeds the cows. Jesus teaches the disciples. So, Who's doing the teaching and who's doing the feeding? Well, Mike's feeding, right, the cows, and Jesus is teaching. That's that's who's doing the action. But the passive verb tells us who or what receives the action. The cow was fed by Mike. The disciples were taught by Jesus. Now we're like, okay, so the passive tells us who got the action given to them in a sense. So now we're looking at the cows got it and the disciples got it. The disciples were the ones who received the teaching. But in Colossians 3.18, something else is going on here. 
It's a middle voice, and we don't have a middle voice in our language. But the middle voice tells us the subject is doing and receiving the action. Now, we see this in the Bible, and it's kind of weird, but it is informative. We have passages like, and Judas went out and hanged himself. Like, huh, that's kind of strange. Or, we, or here's a, another example. It's not a biblical example, but we would say, we say of a person like, Dave drove himself. Like, okay, that tells us something. He's all by himself driving. Often the middle and voice implies a volunteer, the volunteerness of the person. Now, to add with what was just said, we would translate the verse like this. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as is fitting to the Lord. The command there implies, women, you yourselves submit to your husbands. Where most of your translations just say, submit to your husbands. The way this is laid out, it's wives, You take it upon yourselves to make this choice in following this command to submit. Now, we're going to explain and expand upon this idea. And there are parameters that go along with this. That's important. You've got to be married, of course. But we're going to see how this whole thing works out. But the importance of that volunteer action, we see over and over again, Because throughout the New Testament, so much of the New Testament, it is a voluntary action on our part. Isn't it? God does not command us and make us and say, child of God, you better. So much of the Christian life is, hey, based upon this truth, will you or won't you? Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you by the mercies of God, have a transformed mind. Based upon Romans 1 through chapter 11, based upon all this fantastic truth, how should we behave? We should think different. And because we're thinking different, we should act different. Right? Wives, because you are seen with Christ, volunteer yourself to submit to your husbands. Now, there's a, the language part of it. The language lesson is over. Let's move to the place of submission. Now, the place of submission, the word hupatasso means to place under, to affix, to be subordinate, to subject oneself, to be in a subservient role or to submit voluntarily. It is a military term that's used and spoken of of rank, to rank under. The private ranks under a general. But everybody or anybody who's ever been in military service knows that it's not talking about the quality of the person. It's talking about authority. Because everybody knows that some of those people who are up in ranks, they're not top quality people, but in the military, you've got to have some sort of order and authority. In the Bible, we are not following a chain of command, but authority of love. It's an order of subordination. And we see this in the Godhead and in creation. So I mentioned we got to turn to some passages. So I'm going to ask you to start doing that. Turn to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, so we can start seeing some of these things. We'll see if your phones are faster than my fingers turn into the pages. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, it says, But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. We see in this divine order of subordination. Isn't that amazing? How can we reject this word of submission when we see it's actually in the Godhead? Now, we're going to return to this verse a little bit later. But I just want us to see right now, there is a place of subjection or submission that's in the Bible. We see between God the Father and God the Son. And we need to understand the word so we can understand the command that's given. So we're going to turn to just a number of passages. And I want us to see the idea of what's taking place here. So we're not going to try to fully expand every verse. So go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. Ephesians chapter 1. 
Everything is to be submitted to Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. And he put all things under his feet, and he gave him to be head over all things to the church. Wow. Which is the body, the fullness of him, who fills all in all. Everything is under Christ. You don't see the word submission here, but submission is taking place, isn't it? Isn't everything subjected to Christ? Do you see that? You're not looking at me like you got that you're, you're seeing this. So I'm, do we need to slow down a little bit? All things are underneath Jesus because he is the head of all things. All right. So submission and creation is a key thing. So we see that in action, it's taking place. Romans chapter 13, verse 1. In Romans chapter 13, verse 1. We are, there's a submission to government. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there's no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Now this is a reference to Christians submitting themselves to a higher authority in government. Now you may not like the governing body that's over you. It doesn't matter. You submit to the rules that are there. We live in a funny government where we can vote and change those things. So vote and change them. We don't resist them in the sense that I don't like that law that says drive this, this speed, so I'm going to drive 120 until I get caught. Okay? That's not right. We're supposed to submit ourselves to those laws. We can change them. We, can, we have a pathway of changing them. But in those day and age, Paul lived under Nero. There was no pathway to change those laws. What Nero said was law. Just in case we think this is a mistake, let's just go over to Titus. Because Titus is where Paul is saying, okay, Titus, here's what I want you to do. Here's how I want you to train those who you are passing the baton to. You're passing the truth of God's word to. So Titus chapter 3, verse 1. Remind them to be subject to the rulers and authorities to obey, to be ready for every good work. So part of the Christian life is not teaching people to rebel, but pe teaching people to submit to the authority that's over them. So as missionaries are going out, they are not starting revolutions around the world. They are teaching them in whatever country they're in to be good citizens, to submit to the authority that's over them. And there have been some ruthless, ruthless dictators in which Christianity has come into. But our focus is not about changing government. Our focus has been, let's teach Jesus Christ. That's what we're there for. Right? So we see submission to government. We also see submission to spiritual leaders. You're in Titus, go right. Go to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13. Again, you might just be writing these down and looking them up later. But I just want us to see how this works. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13. He says, Therefore submit yourselves to every, every institution of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king or to, to those supreme. So we see that we see spiritual leadership that's taking place here. And then he continues on to governors and to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers. So we see, again, this is leadership that's placed over the Christian. And since you're in 1 Peter, now let's go back to your left. Go to James chapter 4. In James chapter 4, verse 7. 4, 7, he says, therefore submit to God. Christians, we're supposed to submit ourselves to God too. Resist the devil, he'll flee from you, but submit yourselves to God. Put yourself underneath him, yield to him. Now, I know we've already been in Ephesians, and you say, why can't we just stay in one book and get all of them in on that one? I know, but go back to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. I'm going, to, I'm going to have to skip a few of these. Ephesians chapter 5, 21, it says, Submitting to one another in the reverence of God. This is speaking about Christians and our attitude towards one another. We are supposed to submit ourselves to one another. 
The word isn't found in verse 22 where it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands. It's not there. It's implied from verse 21 where it says, We're supposed to submit to one another. Then it says, Wives, to your own husbands as to the Lord. To, so wives, what are you supposed to do? Well, it's just implied there. But if you skip down to verse 24, it says, Just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives to their own husbands be subject to their own husbands in everything. So there again, we're seeing... Here we see it, the example, and then it's supposed to be applied. In Titus 2.9, servants, submit to your masters. Go to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2.51. Here we have Jesus as a boy. And he went down with them and he came to Nazareth and was subject to them. So Jesus as a young boy, he submitted himself to his mother and to his father. Wow. Jesus was in subjection to his human parents. Is that incredible or what? That should cause us to say, do you see how... Submission is part of life for the Christian. It is used throughout the New Testament. And I didn't hit on all the specific roles like Colossians 3.18 and Titus 2.5 and 1 Peter 3.1 and what we did talk about Ephesians. But we recognize the place of submission in the life of the believer. It does not promote inferiority. Nor does it carry an attitude of weakness. There's a divine place and purpose for submission. It's the specific responsibility given to the wife in the marriage role. She is to guard the role and the function of submission. And the marriage responsibility, as we see laid out here, as Paul is speaking to the wives, wives, guard submission. This is your task in the relationship between your husband and He's going to be guarding something else, but your job is guard the submission. Take care of that. Now, that's the place of submission. And you can't help but recognize that submission is part of the entire Christian life. And so as Paul is addressing it to wives, it's not like, it's not a put down. It's not suppressing women. It's like here is a given task specifically for women in the marriage relationship. Okay? It's not for women to all, it's not all women are supposed to be submissive to all men. That is a perversion. It is reflected to women, wives specifically, and it is only to their husbands. Okay. Now we see the privilege of submission. Turn back to 1 Colossians. Or Colossians, say first Colossians. Colossians 1, or Colossians 11, 3. I've got to get over there too. Colossians 11, 3. Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I, I, I'm saying the wrong thing. It's 1 Corinthians, sorry. 1 Corinthians 11, 3. We just want to see the privilege of how this works because the privilege of this, we have an, an equality through all of this. It says, I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of woman is man and the head of Christ is God. So the subordination is the subordination of equals. Christ is equal to the Father. And yet we see that he constantly says, I and the Father are one. If you want to see the Father, here I am. You see me? I am the Father. We are one. And yet, there is a distinction still that's there. But what about the husbands and wives? Are you equal? The answer is yes. This is not a trick question. It is yes. It is always yes. You say, well, I don't feel very equal sometimes. Okay. Okay. Send your husbands to me. We'll work on that. 
When Christ spoke in John about his equality with the Father, he's claiming the same substance. That's important. As to the persons, the husband and the wife became one. It's, in fact, the way God designed the husband and wife. When they come together, they are seen as one unit. We may not think of them as one often. Today, we want to see them as two separate people, but they are considered and viewed as one. The husband is to be the spiritual leader. Well, whatever that means. And we're going to get to that in upcoming weeks when we, when we address the fathers. But, but who is the dominant person in the home that is giving the instruction for spiritual material to the family? Wait a minute, I mean, is it not, is it not the moms? Go to 1 Timothy. Go to 1 Timothy just for a second. I mean, this is just... 1 Timothy chapter 5. Verse 14, it says, there, Therefore I desire that the, young, young, the younger, marry, uh, younger widows marry, bear children, manage the household, and give no opportunity to the adversary, the adversary to speak reproachfully. This is just something I find kind of funny, because in this whole thing, the wife is to be the ruler of the home. I like that. It says manage in my Bible, but the word there is really the word that we get, the word despot. Of the home. She is to manage or despot. Now, I've talked to a lot of kids who they think that their mom is a despot ruler. She controls the house with an iron fist. And maybe you had a mom like that. When I find out who's the disciplinary of the house, the kids make mom. It's not even a pause in the conversation, mom. Mom said this and did this, and the kids scattered. Okay. But when we read 2 Timothy, so you're in 1 Timothy, go to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, uh, chapter 1, verse 5. Paul says, Now I call to remembrance your genuine faith that is in you, he's talking to Timothy, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm persuaded is also in you. Who taught Timothy the things of the Lord? Grandma and mom instilled in the kids. Where was dad? Like most dads, he's been out working. So who is with the kids all day long teaching them the word of God? Moms play a dramatic role in, during those first five years where kids, kids are sponges. That is those, those are the years that are most... Uh, most of the formations and stuff that go on with kids. Moms play that huge role in shaping and directing a kid, a child. We can't under, undercut that at all. There's an equality of person, and that should not blind us that there are some areas in the house where the wife is superior. We just recognize, see, that's it. That's just how it is. Moms are piece by piece, like feeding a little bird, feeding kids. Here's a Bible verse, and here's how to apply it. Dad comes home from work. Now, that might seem kind of old-fashioned from where we're at today, but oftentimes, Dad's working a lot of hours, and I know things are changing, and those roles are starting to change and have changed in many homes. So maybe if you're dad, if you're at home all the time, you might have to be the one that's intentionally feeding your kids the Word of God. Because in those young years, they are soaking up everything, and you're setting them on a path, a spiritual path. Don't underestimate that time, because we see this is where Timothy got his stuff. Now, oftentimes we look at Timothy's dad, we know he's a Greek, we're like, well, he's a deadbeat. We don't know that. He was probably a great provider. All we know is that he learned what he learned from his grandma, and it was passed to his mom, and then on to Timothy. And Paul took him on as a spiritual father in the Lord, and they did fantastic things for the Lord. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 11, 11. So we see that there is an there is a equality in the sense of substance. 
Now, when we say there's an equality of substance, remember, the woman was taken from the man. Now, we're not missing anything, man. Don't get it by in this weird idea that you're missing a rib or something when the woman was created. You're not. You were formed from the dirt of the ground. So you are dirt. But the woman was made from soft, fleshy stuff from your side to come alongside and to help you, to complement you. And so you're made from the same substance. 1 Corinthians 11, 11. I'm out, I'm out of time. It says, nevertheless, man is, is, neither is man independent of woman, nor is woman independent of man in the Lord. We are needed together. So let me just stop with this. That we see that our substances, we are required, but there's also a sense that we are, uh, I'm not be able to get to the rest of this, so I'll have to save this for later, but there is a connection between us that's more than just substance. Sexually, there is equality, and also spiritually there's equality that we have. That's all tied in how the Bible sees us and pictures the role of the woman in submission. As we address the condition and the conduct of the wives next week, in the meantime, we have to ask ourselves, what do we do with this type of a message? Well, hopefully we have a better understanding of what submission is, its place and its privilege in our life. And we have to determine what role do we want to have as wives. Does your husband see the life of Christ live through you? Women, do you want to say, oh God, I want to be a woman with biblical principles. One who follows your standards. I want to determine right now to be a godly woman. If that's you, then that needs to be your prayer request to God. Men, we need to say, oh Lord, I want to recognize a godly woman that I might be an encouragement to her. That needs to be our prayer request. Not falling into all the reasoning things that we saw in chapter 2. The world is trying to change our ideas. The promotion of liberation is nothing more than bondage. Christ has set us free. Let us be free in what he's given to us. Let's pray. Let me, Father, we thank you for our time together. We thank you for your word. We ask, Lord, that as we think upon these great truths, that you would help us to apply them into our life. Thank you, Lord, for the women that are in our church who seek after you, who desire to be and follow the standard that you lay out here that have said no to the constant barraging of the new images of women that are constantly put before them. And for the men, Lord, who are encouraging and, and holding to that standard also. Give us wisdom as we approach these things in the week. Help us to have a, the right attitude. And we pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.